Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear reports from Andrew Smith and Brian Lynn. My co-host Dan Novak presents this week's education report. He will also answer a few questions about his story. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Andrew Smith. Confusion over the standing of Iran's morality police. Continues after state media gave different reports over the weekend, but more Iranian women have appeared in public without the required head-covering hijab, as enforcement of the policy has been reduced. The morality police were established. In 2005, the group oversees the enforcement of Iran's restrictions on behavior and clothing in public. Women are required to wear the hijab and loose-fitting clothes. The decreased enforcement might be a sign that Iran's leadership. Is thinking about making changes to reduce anti-government protests. The protests began after the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in September. She died while being held by the morality police for violating the country's Islamic dress rules. A group called Human Rights Activists in Iran has been following protests around the country. It said the government's actions have resulted in 471 deaths during the protests, and more than 18,200 people have been arrested. On Saturday, Iran's semi-official news agency ISNA reported that the government's chief lawyer said the morality police had been closed. The official, Mohammad Jafar Montazeri, told the news agency that the government was also reviewing the hijab law. Without giving details, but late Sunday, state media Al Alam issued a report suggesting Montazeri's comments had been misunderstood. It said that no official has confirmed the closing of the morality police. The conservative. SNN.IR news website also said the morality police were not closed, but it added that the way the police do their job might change. The news site is close to the Basij, a security force under the powerful Revolutionary Guard, which protects. Iran's religious leaders. Officials have avoided comment on the police. Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian gave no direct answer when reporters in Belgrade asked him about Montazeri's statement. In recent weeks, fewer morality police officers. Have been seen in Iranian cities. In the capital of Tehran, 
more women have been walking the city's streets without wearing the hijab. At times, some even walk past anti-riot police and Basiji forces. I'm Andrew Smith. Afghanistan's Taliban-led government says it will permit girls to take their high school graduation exams this week. The move came although the Taliban earlier banned girls from attending middle and high school. The Associated Press reported the decision was communicated in documents written by Afghanistan's Ministry of Education. Two documents seen by the AP suggested the exams would be given in 31 of the country's 34 provinces, where the winter school break starts in late December. The three excluded provinces, Kandahar, Helmand, and Nimraz, have a different plan for the school year, and graduation exams there usually take place later. Esanullah Kitab is head of the education department in the capital, Kabul. He told the AP the exams would take place on Wednesday, but he provided no additional details, and it was not clear how many teenage girls would be able to take the exam. One document from Kabul's education department said the exams would last from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. One 18-year-old girl criticized the Taliban's offering. The girl, who only identified her first name, Najela, told the AP she would now be in twelfth grade and eligible for the exam. But she said she had spent the whole year out of school facing tension and stress. How can we possibly take an exam after a year and a half that the Taliban have kept school doors closed? She added, the Taliban took over Afghanistan in August 2021 as American and NATO forces were in the final weeks of their pullout from the country after 20 years of war. At first, Taliban leaders promised a moderate form of government rule and to respect women's and minority rights. But since taking over the country, the Taliban has widely restricted rights and freedoms and put in place their extreme version of Islamic law, known as Sharia law. The Taliban has banned girls from middle school and high school and restricted women from most employment. It has also ordered women to wear clothing that fully covers their bodies in public. Women have also been banned from parks, exercise places called gyms, and some public events. However, women have not been restricted from attending universities. The latest decision is believed to be a way for Afghan girls who receive a high school diploma after Wednesday's exam to be able to register to attend universities. I'm Brian Lynn. Students at American public schools struggled in math during the pandemic. The National Assessment of Education Progress, or NAEP, is a math and reading test given to 4th and 8th grade students in public schools around the country. Results from this year 
showed that students' scores had the largest decreases in math since 1990, when the test was first released. All areas of the U.S. reported lower test scores in math. More than one-third of students scored below basic levels. The decreases were also more severe in math than in reading. There has been a lot of evidence showing that students struggled with remote learning during the pandemic. They especially struggled with math, said Frances Anderson. She is an education researcher with the University of Nebraska Omaha and a former teacher. Her work centers on math ability. She said in an interview with The Conversation that students, who are not as skilled in math, need more face-to-face learning. Anderson said that during remote learning, teachers didn't have as many ways to keep students engaged. It was difficult to do hands-on activities and project-based learning, which are better for students who struggle in math. She added that a lot of teaching math is visual learning. You need so much more than one screen, she said. Heather Hill and John Starr are professors at Harvard University's School of Education. They spoke on Harvard University's education podcast about the NAEP results. Hill said, Math scores have always been more sensitive than reading and English scores to students' opportunities to learn. She said a lot of reading skills are developed in the home in addition to school. Kids can read books and the internet at home, or read text messages from friends, for example. But there are fewer ways for kids to work on math skills outside of the classroom. School is the only place that kids, for the most part, learn math, Hill said. Starr, who is also a math teacher, argued that NAEP scores were low for 8th graders, because of the age at which these students started learning remotely. He said that the two years leading up to 8th grade, where scores declined the most, are extremely important for building math skills. He said those are the years when students start moving from arithmetic to algebra and other more complex mathematics. The NAEP for 8th graders largely tests algebra skills. So it's no surprise that they're really struggling. Those struggles are not going to be easy to make go away, Starr said. He added that in online learning, teachers were forced to teach math using the least desirable aspects of math instruction that we would want to see. Teachers had to lecture more, and there was less student interaction, which is not as effective for math instruction, he said. It's not necessarily the teacher's fault. It's just the way that they've been forced to teach during the pandemic, Starr said. Hill added that there is some evidence that teachers do not perform as well when they teach math. Often, teachers do not especially enjoy math, nor think of themselves as math experts, she said. And that feeling can make it hard to teach the subject confidently. Both said it's going to be very difficult for schools to make up for learning losses during the pandemic, especially for the students who struggled the most. Especially with math, students returned from the pandemic with uneven abilities. It can be hard for teachers to form lesson plans for entire classes when the skills are so varied among students, Starr said. They agreed that to make up for the loss in learning, students are going to need a lot of extra help outside the classroom. Students who have fallen behind should have twice as much instruction, said Anderson from the University of Nebraska. Resources should go to students and communities which struggled the most, often minorities, Hill suggested. For example, tutoring students in small groups can help kids catch up in math. Hill said, although difficulties lie ahead, kids are pretty resilient. You give kids opportunities to learn, and they learn stuff. I'm Dan Novick. You 
just heard Dan Novak present this week's education report. Dan joins us now to talk more about the story. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Ashley. Glad to be here. Your story is about how students' math scores decreased this year after two years of learning during the pandemic. One of the Harvard professors quoted in your story. John Starr said that eighth graders especially struggled, and that their age may have played a part in that. Can you explain what he meant by that? Sure. So the NAEP test is given out to fourth and eighth grade students to test average reading and math levels around the country. What Starr was saying is that the two years or so leading up to eighth grade is a very important time in learning math. Around that age, students start moving away from simple arithmetic, things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and start learning algebra. So, in other words, math gets harder around eighth grade. Right. The NAEP at the eighth grade level largely tests algebra ability, and many students struggled with online learning during the pandemic, as we know. So many students returned to school after two years of remote learning, who just weren't ready to be tested in algebra. Star argues that scores dropped as a result. That makes sense. Thanks for explaining that, Dan. You're welcome. Welcome to the making of a nation. American history in VOA Special English. Throughout most of the 1850s, war was a continual threat between the North and the South over the issue of slavery. Then, in the autumn of 1859, the crisis seemed to calm. Anti-slavery extremists governed only a few states of the North. And pro-slavery extremists held power in only a few states of the Deep South. There had been elections in most of the northern and southern states. Voters had rejected candidates with extremist ideas and elected moderates instead. The public saw the elections as a sign of hope. That reasonable people might find a way to settle the bitter dispute over slavery, but these hopes fell apart on October seventeenth, eighteen fifty-nine. That day brought the news that a group of abolitionists had attacked the town of Harper's Ferry. The town was then part of Virginia. Today, it is part of West Virginia. Now. Jack Moyles and Harry Monroe continue our story. The attack was led by John Brown, an old anti-slavery extremist. Many believed him insane. He had gone to Kansas and fought bitterly against pro-slavery forces. Once, to answer an attack on the town of Lawrence, Brown and his men. Pulled five men and boys from their homes and murdered them. The wife of one of the men said Brown told her, "If a man stands between me and what I believe to be right, I will take his life as coolly as I would eat my breakfast." Brown lost a son in a pro-slavery attack on his home. At Osawatomie, Kansas, Brown and his friends were forced to flee. They watched as the pro-slavery men burned the town. Brown shook with grief and anger. "I have only a short time to live," he said. "Only one death to die, and I will die fighting for this cause." There will be no more peace in this land until slavery is done for. I will give them something else to do than to extend slave territory. 
I will carry this war into the South. To fight a war against slavery, Brown needed money and guns. He went to Massachusetts and New York. He spoke at town meetings and met privately with abolitionist leaders. In these private talks, Brown said it was too late to settle the slave question through politics or any other peaceful way. He said the only answer was a slave rebellion. It would be bloody, Brown said, and this was terrible. But slavery itself was a terrible wrong, the same as murder. Only blood, he said, would wash away the wrongs of slavery. Brown said God meant for him to begin this rebellion by invading Virginia with a military force he already was organizing. Brown said even if the rebellion failed, it would probably lead to a civil war between North and South. In such a war, he said, the North would break the chains of the black man on the battlefield. Brown won the support of a group of abolitionist leaders. They formed a secret committee and called themselves the Secret Six. They agreed to advise Brown and, more importantly, to raise $1,000 for him. From New England, Brown went to Chatham, Canada. He went there for a secret convention he had called to form a revolutionary government. This government would rule all the slave territory that Brown and his men could capture. Forty-six representatives went to the convention, thirty-four Negroes and twelve whites. Brown told them of his plan. He said he was sure that southern slaves were ready for rebellion. He said they would rise up at the first sign of a leader who wished to break their chains. But what if troops are brought against you? One man asked. Brown answered that his men would fight in the mountains where a small force could stop a much larger one. He said his men would be well trained in mountain fighting. Brown said he expected his small force to grow much larger. He would invite the slaves he freed to join his army. And he said he thought that all the free Negroes of the North would come to fight slavery with him. The representatives approved Brown's constitution, and they named him Commander-in-Chief. Brown had decided to strike at Harper's Ferry, a town of about 2,500 people. It was in northern Virginia, about 100 kilometers north of Washington. Harper's Ferry was built on a narrow finger of land where the Shenandoah River flowed into the Potomac River. There were two bridges. One crossed the Shenandoah. The other, a railroad bridge, crossed the Potomac to Maryland. John Brown chose Harper's Ferry because there was a factory there that made guns for the army. There also was an arsenal where several million dollars' worth of military equipment was kept. Brown needed the guns and equipment for the slave army he hoped to form. Old Brown arrived at Harper's Ferry early in July 1859. Two of his sons, Owen and Oliver, and another man came with him. They rented an old house on a farm in Maryland, not far from Harper's Ferry. 
Brown told people that he was a cattle buyer from New York. Brown's men joined him, one or two at a time, over the next several months. They traveled at night so no one would see them. Once they reached the farmhouse, they had to stay in hiding. Week by week, the little force grew. But it grew too slowly. By the end of summer, there were still less than twenty men hiding in the old house. Brown wrote letters to his supporters in the north. He asked for more money and more men. He got little of either. His supporters were afraid. Too many people knew of Brown's plans. The secret six feared they would face criminal charges if Brown attacked Harper's Ferry. Brown's men grew tired of the small, crowded rooms of the farmhouse. Brown knew he must act soon, or his young men would begin leaving. On Saturday, October 15th, three men arrived to join the group. One of them brought $600 in gold for Brown's use. Brown saw the gold as a sign that God wanted him to act. He told his men they would strike the next night. Brown held religious services Sunday morning and prayed for God to help him free the slaves. Then he called his men around him to explain to them his battle plan. They would seize the two bridges at Harper's Ferry and close them. Next, they would capture the armory and the rifle factory. They would capture as many people as possible. They would use the people as hostages for protection against any soldiers that might be sent against them. The army had no men near Harper's Ferry. Brown believed he would have all the time he needed. He believed his only opposition might be local groups of militia. He did not fear these civilian soldiers. The old man thought he and his men could hold Harper's Ferry until slaves in the area rebelled and joined them. Brown knew that Maryland and western Virginia were full of people opposed to slavery. He expected many of them to come to his aid. The twenty-two men rested until dark, listening to rain hit the roof of the farmhouse. About eight o'clock, Brown called his group. Men, he said, get your weapons. We are going to the ferry. A wagon was brought out and a horse tied to it. In the wagon were a few tools and some extra guns. Brown climbed into the wagon and started it toward town. Two of his men stepped out in front of the wagon, leading the way. The others walked behind. It was a dark and cold night. A light rain was falling. There was no one else on the road. After a time, they reached the high ground above the Potomac. Below them, across the river, lay the town of Harper's Ferry. Most of the town was sleeping. Only a few lights shone through the rain. John Brown was ready for his final struggle against slavery. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm...